Hi, my name is Danielle Barreca with the Napa County Historical Society Board of Directors. Thank you for tuning in today. It is because of the support of members like you that we are able to still provide content during this challenging time. Please consider renewing your membership or gifting a membership to a friend or family member. Thank you and we hope you tune in again. Thank you, everybody. Um, welcome to the Napa County Historical Society A virtual presentation. Uh, COVID has forced us to be innovative along with many others in this new medium where we're apart but together. Um, I'm thrilled about tonight's presentation and I'm very grateful that, that you're joining us. Um, I want to say, um, I want to introduce a couple people. Um, for those who don't know, I guess I should start with myself. My name is Liz Alessio. I'm the executive director for the Napa County Historical Society. Hi, Shannon. Historical Society. With me this evening, we have our research librarian, Nikkel Riggs. She's upstairs. We're both in the beloved, beautiful Goodman building right now. We have Dr. Shelley O. Smith, the extraordinary Shelley, who's our <laughs> president and um, extraordinaire and she's managing the technical end. So if you get muted or you get dropped off, we can all blame Shelly. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm very grateful she's handling the technical side because that's my least favorite of these events is, is this portion. Um, so, but most of all and most importantly, we have all of you who value history, especially history in Napa County and how, and how it ties to California history. I want to start this evening with about the Historical Society, just a real quick plug. Um, we have membership opportunities. I don't know if you're a current member, if you're a past member, if you even knew that we have memberships, but the memberships really, really support our mission, our programs, our exhibits, and we'd love to invite you to be a member. A membership start anywhere from $30 annually on up. In addition, we have sponsorship opportunities. So I'm just gonna make a plug. Um, it's a new era of exhibits here at the Historical Society at the Goodman Library, which you'll hear later um, following the presentation. I have a few save the dates and some special items I wanna share with you, including our fall exhibit. Um, our agenda tonight um, will be after I get to introduce our guest speaker, which is really why we're all here, Denise Jaffke, who's a senior archaeologist for California State Parks. After her presentation, which will be roughly 40 minutes, um, we'll have 10 minutes of Q&A. So please don't hesitate to put questions and comments in that chat box for Nikkel, okay? And that you'll find the chat box is at the bottom of, of your screen. Um, and as I said, we'll have a few, say the dates, um, to talk about following the presentation. Um, but I think this is a good time for me to go ahead and introduce um, Denise. It really is a pl pl pleasure and a privilege to have Denise with us. Um, this is a really fascinating presentation. Um, as I already mentioned, she's a senior archaeologist for California State Parks. Denise has worked as a professional archaeologist for various federal and state land managing agencies for over 25 years. She manages Parks Maritime Heritage Program and serves as a Diving Safety Board Advisor and Dive Team Instructor. Denise is one of the founding members of Schooners, a nonprofit organization devoted to researching, investigating, and reporting on underwater cultural heritage along California's coastline. She is also responsible for opening California's first underwater trail at Emerald Bay in Lake Tahoe. She's an amazing asset for both terrestrial and underwater cultural heritage in California. Please help me welcome Denise as she presents the Redwood Coast and Napa, how do they connect? Denise, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Liz, thanks everybody. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and hopefully I'll answer that question. How does the Redwood Coast and Napa, how do they connect? Um, and, uh, but first I wanted to um, talk briefly about, uh, you know, cause as you had mentioned Liz, my day job, I work as an archeologist for parks, um, but, but tonight I'm representing schooners um, and schooners, it stands for uh, Sonoma Coast Historic and Undersea Nautical Research Society. Um, it's a new all volunteer organization 
that, as Lid already said, promotes maritime cultural heritage in California. And um, a quick introduction to our board. Um, well, Shelley serves on that board too. She's our vice president, uh, maritime archaeologist and educator with YKT Consulting. Um, we also have uh, John Harold, who is our president. He is an avocational archaeologist um, and uh, a volunteer for our Maritime Heritage uh, uh, Program at Parks. He also works with Jason Harum, um, who is our treasurer. He's a diving safety officer um, for UC Davis, the Dega Marine Lab. So that's kind of who we are. Um, we've started collecting members, so you might want to consider that one too. Just, you know, start collecting societies. Um, <laughs> So, but how it all started, um, it kind of, this is kind of our origin story, but I'll make it quick. Um, most of us met during this project. It was um, the Dog Hole Ports project on Sonoma Coast. And it was a multidisciplinary team from NOAA, Parks, um, Sonoma State University, uh, UC Davis, and San Francisco Maritime Museum. And we did some field work in 2016 and 2017. And that's where uh, we met and kind of shared this, um, had recognized that we had a shared passion uh, for the maritime uh, resources. Um, and we wanted to find a way to continue the work that we were doing in after 2017. Um, we had researched a total of 14 dog hole ports, um, but there was so much more to do. <laughs> And so we just decided to, to create a, an organization to kind of carry that on. <clears throat> so before we delve into the topic of large scale lumbering along the North Coast and affiliated ports, I wanted to consider this region during the early 19th century before that big lumbering industry started. The arrival of Russian colonial interest on the North, Northern California coast in 1812 fundamentally changed how people regarded the area. Um, in comparison to the indigenous culture of the Kashaya Pomo that had resided there for millennia and considered themselves part of the land, you had the European worldviews come in and that connection to the world economic system meant that the Redwood Coast became a place to secure exportable uh, commodities, if you will. And sea otters became the first casualty of that perspective. Um, and the local extinction of that species, amongst other factors, led to the departure of Russian colonists from the area um, right after 1840. And that power vacuum, at least if we see it in the European, Euro-American perspective, um, created opportunities for new people to further exploit the area's natural resources. And so Californios, Americans, and Europeans began to subdivide the area for use and development soon after. The, as most things happen with California, right? Everything starts with the gold rush or the big stuff happens with the gold rush. And this is uh, no different. The subsequent boom introduced tremendous amount of demand for lumber. Um, leading to the large-scale logging along the appropriately named Redwood Coast, uh, which extended from, as you see in the map on the left, Southern Oregon, uh, past Monterey Bay to Big Sur. Um, and what they refer to as the timber rush was really only second to the gold rush and had a massive impact on California's development and commercial growth during the 19th and early 20th centuries. And as a major uh, port on the Pacific and with expanding maritime trade to global markets, San Francisco saved, um, served as the initial market and distributor of the coast extensive lumber, um, as well as other products. And um, Euro-American explorers of the coastal redwood forests in the early 1850s um, north of San Francisco, they were looking and finding massive trees and could be, and they realized that these could be commercially harvested. The 
the only problem was to how to get these um, timber products to the market to San Francisco. Um, the roads at the time uh, were either non-existent or too crude to carry um, vast quantities of, of uh, heavy resources like lumber and timber. Um, and so the rugged shoreline had few roads and the most cost effective way and the quickest way to move lumber was, um, was by way of the Pacific Ocean. And as the San Francisco Journal of Commerce notes uh, a little bit later in 1879, um, even then they say no railroads yet interfere with the coastal trade. The wind serve the vessels cheaper than the coal does the engine and canvas yet retains its supremacy over iron in the carrying trade in this part of the world. So this is a picture of a dog hole port, a typical dog hole port, small, um, out at Timber Cove. And we don't have an, a known date, but it looks to be a younger one, uh, I mean, an earlier version. We have that two-masted schooner that's, that's uh, moored at the end of this uh, uh, loading chute. This would be considered what they called a trough chute, an earlier version. A later version comes in about 1880s. Um, but at this time, enterprising men uh, rigged networks of chutes and cables uh, all over these little tiny inlets um, down into small coves, allowing material to be transferred essentially from shore to the waiting ship as we see here. And the system employed schooners as the most common type of American small craft. Um, built locally of native Douglas fir, hundreds of Pacific Coast schooners worked the coast, many of them individually owned, sufficiently small to work in and out of these small coastal inlets. Um, they operated in the maritime trades and they were considered tramps, carrying many types of cargo, um, regularly calling on the North Coast ranches, but also all around the Bay Area and south, uh, south of the Bay Area as well. And they were considered ubiquitous. I mean, uh, almost like Highway 80. This is how um, along the coast would have been just the ocean highway. Um, they're looking at these schooners. You have the uh, fore and aft uh, rigging, and that allowed these vessels to tack and made them very maneuverable to get in and out of these small coves. Um, and they're like what they call the stout and deep hulls allow for stowage of cargo both below the hull, uh, below the deck, and on top. And that's what you see in these pictures here. Um, they're loaded with tim timber, um, lumber on top. And in fact, the one on the left, this is both steam and canvas uh, sail schooner. Um, but you can see how low in the water this is riding. Um, so, <laughs> It's pretty remarkable um, how much they would load these up. Um, but beginning in the 1850s, the two-mastered schooner dominated the trade, um, lasting well into the 1890s. And you also see these schooners. Um, this is a picture that Shelley uh, shared with me from the Historical Society, um, the lower left, uh, a schooner called Cinderella. Um, so they were also traveling of course, along those rivers. And by the 1890s, larger three-masted schooners entered the coastal trade, but most were too large to call at, that, at those smaller ports. Um, the introduction of steam schooner and the use of mechanical power to maneuver allowed easier access to some ports, as well as increased capacity for cargo. Um, which allowed the evolution of coastal sh shipping from smaller, more numer numerous two-masted schooners to fewer, larger sail and steam schooners. Um, that also helped drive uh, maybe a move towards larger number of uh, larger ports on the coast, like Port Arena and Guilala. Um, it was also the shift uh, about offloading the product um, where they, was, they used to offload at San Francisco, well, with these steam schooners, they were then um, building out larger networks and um, using ports as far as Seattle and Los Angeles, and then in most cases, uh, in some cases, Australia and Asia.
by the beginning, but in the beginning in the 1860s, uh, when these smaller ports are operating, um, these smaller landings known regionally and colloquially as dog hole ports essentially define the Northern California coastline maritime landscape, if you will. Um, dog hole ports were considered by mariners to be landings, although um, they were not, uh, they didn't tie up to a pier or dock structures. Rather, they would moor up some distance from shore. Um, and that was basically due to uh, reef and rock close to shore. Um, but the network of dog hole ports were essential components to the successful lumbering ventures and essentially the community ve development of the area. Um, the engineering and the technological development made these tiny inlets along the coast into centers of commerce. Um, and dog hole ports were key to the industry for over 70 years uh, until roads and railroads replaced them um, uh, through the main shipping outlet. This is, I love this photo because it kind of captures all of it all in one view. Um, this is Fort Ross. <clears throat> and you see that this is an earlier version of a trough chute. Um, and you have a schooner waiting on the right, a smaller two-masted schooner. You also see Call Ranch in the background to the right. Um, and then you see the um, agrarian light, uh, landscape in the back, um, the ranching activity. So you kind of have it all in one scene. Um, Fort Ross, along with Stewart's Point, uh, was used uh, quite a bit um, because of their sheltered coves. Um, and there's a, a lot of resources there as well. So, uh, so I wanted to kind of look at a few examples um, to kind of, to kind of uh, explain these uh, dog hole ports and, and what they look like and how they functioned. And so Salt Point Landing is located in present day Salt Point State Park and is one of 57 landing sites along the Sonoma and Mendocino Coast. There are others uh, more to the north and also um, down south, essentially wherever redwoods groves would grow, um, but we just haven't got there yet. We're just still focusing on uh, the ones close to home for now but um, hopefully we'll get there. And Salt Point Landing with its water portion known as Gerstle Cove is an indentation along the Sonoma County coastline approximately about 20 miles northwest of San Francisco. And Salt Point was named uh, for the salt crystals that would form in cracks along the rocky coastline. Before Euro-American occupation, the Kashaya Pomo collected salt from this area and traded it with inland groups. Um, there are actually two historic landings located in the park. Um, one is Fist Mill, shown here to the north, um, and it's located about two and a half miles north of Salt Point on the other side of Mill Creek. And Walsh Landing is uh, just about a mile and a half uh, south of that. The offshore area of Salt Point Landing is within um, Salt Point State Marine Conservation Area, um, an area that was established as a marine protected area in 2010 uh, for the purposes of protecting and conserving mar uh, marine life and associated habitats. Um, the park, as shown in the red arrow, that boundary, um, the park actually extends and encompasses one of the state's earliest underwater parks in California, one of 19 California State Parks manages. So this is uh, the same stretch of coastline, but surveyed and mapped by the US Coast Survey in 1878. Fisk Mill, shown up here to the left, is illustrated here. And it's, uh, as you see, it's, it's incredible detail. Um, with roads, buildings, um, and it's so accurate. These surveys were so accurate that um, we would use these maps to locate some of these resources um, if they weren't identified already. And we have even were able to use these maps and geo-reference them and locate some of the underwater features as well. 
um, which is absolutely incredible. Sorry, I'm clicking my mute button accidentally. <laughs> Here we have Salt Point and Gersel Cove with a, a, a transportation system that was built to connect the landings to the mills and resources um, with small little communities growing in concert with these local operations. Products shipped from here mainly focused on redwood lumber, of course, but also tan oak tree bark for tanning hides into leather. And Salt Point was chosen to be a dog hole port um, because of a number of factors, um, including, and, and you'll see this repeatedly along these, um, these ports, but as some better than others, but a suitable cove for vessels to seek enough temporary shelter for mooring. Um, Salt Gersel Cove was perfect for that. Um, topography that allowed a chute to be constructed on the bluff um, and also a, blap, a bluff that actually had flat terrain to house support structures like those loading chutes and associated buildings. Um, it also had to be close to a sawmill or relatively close with transportation network to move materials to the coast uh, somewhat easily, um, access to the sawmill and timberlands, um, and then a nearby market such as San Francisco to sell materials. And then of course, lastly, a community of workers to support um, the enterprise. Salt Point's landing success was not only its geographic suitability um, at the coast as a dock hole port, but it was also due to a supply of um, timber related projects products that were shipped out from its chutes. Um, Salt Point, basically Salt Point Landing emerged on the scene as an important link to the timber industry, basically good to good timing, natural advantages, and geographic location. The area's flat coastal bluffs with interior fo uh, forest, as you see, kind of rising to the right, um, that gradual grade uh, presents the ideal environment for the Salt Point Landings development. And in fact, we'll see later in, in one of the maps that um, that timberline actually was much closer to shore than it is present to present day. Um, but Miller Creek and Miller Gulch, which is uh, just out of viewshed, um, provided access to fresh water, um, timberlands, and water for sawmills, which was an incredibly important uh, uh, resource for the operation of the sawmill. The interior regions had thick vegetation and stands of old growth redwoods, uh, Douglas fir, and Bish and Pine, along with hardwoods like the tan oak and the madrone. Prior to the 1870s, the redwood forest reached all the way down, like I was saying, um, until it was cleared. But then once it was cleared, it was transformed into kind of a brush filled grassland that then after the timber business declined, the land was then used for uh, ranching and agriculture. Lumbering activities, this is a map from uh, Thompson in 1877, but um, I, we know that lumbering activities at Salt Park began right after the gold rush in 1851. And when Samuel Duncan bought part of a, as you see here, the German rancho um, from Henry Hegler to use for timber cutting. Um, we know Duncan, uh, as we'll see later, these names keep popping up uh, because they keep moving um, their timber operations. Uh, once you exploit a certain stand of timber, um, then you need to move, and usually it's moving north. Um, so Duncan is Duncan's Landing to the south. That's another dog hole for it. Um, but it's, uh, and we don't know how, you know, how Duncan uh, operated his landing and what that looked like. We don't have any photos or documentation of that, but we're pretty sure it wasn't anything like the shoot, um, the loading shoots that we see uh, in the 1860s and 70s, and even into the 80s. So here's a close-up version um, of uh, Salt Point Landing. And 
this is um, the 1870s tends to be the most uh, landscape altering period of uh, Salt Point when William Miller and two operations really William Miller um, and Funk and Wasserman um, started uh, taking timber out in this location. Miller built a two-story sawmill located about a half mile up Miller Gulch um, from the coast and it operated only for four years um, beginning in 1872. Miller chose his location well um, in the sense that it was really, uh, it was right at the end of the creek, um, right on a, a relatively flat piece of land. It had access to water and close proximity to redwood trees. And many of these places are, there's nothing left, uh, but are, we record them as archeological sites anymore. Um, so we know where the sawmill site was and there's still features associated with that mill. Um, this is a, a, a archeological site map that we draw, but we um, noticed that there was um, sandstone rock and brick uh, where a boiler foundation would, it, would be, a boiler would have been used to create steam to operate uh, machinery at the mill. Um, and then there was also a uh, landscape modification to impound water um, to store logs and use for the sawmill. Here we have the close-up version of the mill area. Um, the built environment also included a dozen other structures that supported the workers and their daily needs. And then uh, coming out of the sawmill, you'll see what looks to be a railroad grade. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. <clears throat> Miller's operations um, overlap that with Frederick Funk and Louis Gerstel, um, representing a San Francisco firm, Funk and Wasserman. The company purchased over 3,000 acres at Salt Point Ranch to produce uh, tan bark, posts, and cordwood. The tan bark was for their San Francisco tannery business that operated between 1870 and 1891, um, as well as for the larger market. These resources could be harvested and moved. Um, this image, this illustration is from New York, but we're assuming it looked like much the same. Um, in the sense that these are small, mobile peeling teams, um, uh, and the only signature that would leave is an area devoid of tan oaks, and then also high cut stumps, which we do we do note that today. Um, also evident and an important component of the landscape as these things become tied together is uh, a network of roads to move resources and products from the uplands down to the ports where they were loaded onto vessels. And that natural terrain um, towards the west was a guide, but also it required leveling and clearing to create that roadbed. Um, at Salt Point Landing, there's two types of methods that were used to bring materials to the trough chutes, uh, depending on the operations. And the first in the red was Miller Sawmill, and it goes, um, that's that, uh, what looked to be like a railroad grade, but it's actually a, a horse-driven tramway that um, they would uh, transport their materials to the loading chute um, about a mile and a half along the coastline. Next, um, the Wasserman Group, basically uh, they would transport down and around the uh, rocky head of Salt Point, um, delivering theirs to their own chute. So the fact that these uh, there's two chutes that are operating in the same geographic location means that at this time, there's enough uh, business happening for both that it required two chutes to be operating at the same time. Salt Point Landing had uh, already proven uh, as suitable place for loading vessels by 1870 before mm -hmm. Miller and Funk and Wasserman. Um, the first use of Salt Point as a landing was in the 1850s, as we already uh, hinted at, with the Duncan brothers. But um, the landing was also used um, for quarrying. 
um, we see evidence, and here we on the map on the left, it says quarry abandoned. Um, and this map is 1878, but we know in the 1860s, um, they would quarry sandstone blocks and move them, and they would be transported to San Francisco for um, building materials. Um, and these would have been very heavy indeed, and to get those over and down into the bluff and then onto vessels. And so on the right-hand side, you see a couple examples of those uh, quarried blocks. You can see in the upper hand um, where they were drilling, um, and even in the bottom, you see the drill holes to create that crevice and then snap it apart, but for some, whatever reason, they didn't like that one and they left it in place. Um, they also uh, uh, identified blocks at the bottom of Gerstle Cove as well, numerous blocks. So, um, and not just off the bluff, but in the cove itself, which indicates that they were having problems or one time or several times, um, they would drop those blocks and they would fall off the vessel. Um, but here they are, and uh, those didn't get shipped out, obviously. The loading chutes um, represent that transition point along the coast where the products are transferred from the land to sea to further transport. Um, Miller obtained permission from Funk and Wasserman to build a lumber storage yard, um, warehouses, and his own chute, as we already saw, um, and that happened in 1872. And his main customer was San Francisco firm Higgins and Collins. Um, this was a long-standing relationship uh, that went back to when he was working in Timu Cove, which is another dog hall, hall port in the south. And so it's that, once again, we see them kind of leapfrogging from south closest to San Francisco and constantly moving up as those resources um, get extracted or exhausted. The inner chute, um, as we already said, was um, that of Funk and Wasserman. And their primary business, of course, was the tan bark and cordwood products. Because not only did you need timber for building, but you also needed cordwood in um, some of those cities, San Francisco and the like, because of um, just to try to keep warm. And so uh, wood was always needed. Here we have, um, again, the two T-sheets, um, but looking more like at the community in specifically. And they've become almost like a micro settlement uh, in, in their own rights. The one on the left is the micro settlement like west of uh, Miller's Sawmill. And uh, the other on the right is the Salt Point settlement east of the landing on the right. And as you see, there's several buildings depicted in black re representing both residential and commercial businesses. There's also stables um, and these older maps, um, they're depicted in rectangles with the X's um, and then some are associated with corrals as well. Um, and then what's tying all these things together, of course, is the roads and the road network. Um, in the right, the, this road also marks the dividing line between the flat grassland terrace and the more forested uh, uplands. Um, at least a dozen buildings once occupied the Salt Point settlement, and it, that one was actually positioned along the coastal road, making it an ideal place for hotel and general store. This is a map, um, was late to discover, but this was a great one. This is, um, Thomas Peterson created these maps uh, in 1886 and has tremendous amounts of information, especially if you're looking for underwater archeological resources and where they might be located. Um, but this is a map of Salt Point Landing. It illustrates how the vessel would be positioned under the loading chute. Um, and this was for captains uh, requiring this type of information. And, the image on the left is essentially the, blow, the, the zoomed in version, um, but there's seven lines running across the cove and securing that vessel um, near the bluff and offshore rocks. 
Um, there's a few notations that some are only visible at low tide. Um, that would also be an important consideration for captains timing their arrival and entry. Um, the bow line is running toward the open ocean in deeper water, which would have been, um, which is, as they note here, would have been secured to a 1,300 pound anchor um, at 15 fathoms, which is about 90 feet. And they connect the chain to the mooring anchors with a floating log typically at the surface for easy pickup. Um, here are some of the uh, types of features that we were recording when we were recording uh, Salt Point. There are, up on the right hand side, a lot of them, most of them are hardware. Um, this is actually in great shape. It's um, affixed right into the sandstone rock. Um, that eye bolt is drilled in, and sometimes it has rings, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't have the eyelet, um, but we uh, basically record all of these because it gives us uh, information on the mooring system, not only for the mooring system, but also to help secure that uh, wooden trapeze uh, structure, you know, that loading chute that required um, bracing, essentially. Um, down below is a, an anchor that we discovered. Um, and this one would not have been one of those heavy mooring anchors. It wasn't uh, that large enough. Um, so it was probably just a, a regular ship anchor. The one, the photo next to that um, square, we call them rebates. Um, basically, that's where the wooden legs would have sat in the rock um, to secure the legs there. And then also there's other features that are carved into the sandstorm, again, to kind of help secure that, that structure. Um, and uh, so basically Salt Point operated um, a relatively long time for a small dog hole port. It, it operated for about 60 years until 1912. And then of course, um, we can't consider the maritime cultural landscape without uh, shipwrecks. Um, and at Salt Point, we have a total of nine that's been identified either, um, like some of these are identified in the Gristle Cove um, or at or near Salt Point themselves. The only one that's been located is the Norlina, um, noted here, uh, and it wrecked in 1926. And it represents a steam-driven cargo ship uh, that was built prior to and participated in the World War I. Um, John Harold, uh, along with other members of the Schooners team, are continuing to map and document the debris field associated with this particular wreck, along with others. But um, this one is, is taking a while. It's an area about the size of a football field. And considering that it's next to, uh, it's relatively shallow um, and closer to open ocean, it is surgy, so it's, it's taking a while to map that. But, but that detailed map will provide us information about basically where the ship came to rest, how it came apart, and what um, means ocean dynamics has distributed the pieces throughout uh, the near shore area, basically almost like forensics, um, how, it, how it comes apart. And then uh, we'll just take a quick look at Fisk Mill, um, located north of Salt Point, adjacent waters uh, are in the newly expanded Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary. And this one uh, shows a single trough chute, extends off to the southern end of the projecting cliff on the northeast side of Fisk Mill Cove. And these chutes uh, are often placed on the leeward side of a south facing bluff in attempt to guard against the prevailing north northwesterly winds. There's only a few ports that we looked at that, um, that are located on that exposed open ocean, and they typically do not fare well. <laughs> um, and so a storm either destroys it or um, conditions influence the operators to move on only after a few years. John Colt Fisk was most likely the first person to use the landing um, for lumbering for, you know, starting in about 1860. And he leased the land, about 300 acres of the land from 
again, Samuel Duncan um, of Duncan's Landing, several families of uh, squatters who had been living on the land for years initially contested his arrival, of course. Um, the dispute ended with one squatter murdering another, leaving Duncan, the legal landowner, um, to formally evict the families. But, um, but then the landing at this mill was developed and a small community uh, to uh, service the, heart, the, the port was um, to, to grew out. So the Fisk mill at the landing was short-lived. I mean, uh, Fisk was only there for a few, four, four years, I believe. Um, but he, and then he moved on to Stewart's Point, sold the mill and business to Frederick Helmke, who purchased the land from Duncan in 1865. But still to this day, uh, although it's still referred to as Helmke in some of the newspapers at the time, the Fisk Mill uh, name of the landing and the cove still persists. Um, Helmke, in fact, uh, Helmke continued the lumber trade and it actually uh, took off after Fisk. Um, it's like uh, his estate was worth at the time about 30, they estimate $30,000 and he reportedly employed 30 lumbermen and several teamsters. Um, coastal shipping records show that Fisk Mill Landing was highly productive um, along the coast and between a six year period in the eight, late 1860s, over 400 scooters loaded lumber, cordwood posts and tan bark cargoes for San Francisco market out of Fisk Mill. Eventually, as the rest of the region, the decline in the market led Helmke to move his mill to Mendocino, north, in 1875. Um, but he didn't leave the area until uh, a few years later, in 1880, I believe. Um, with the mill no longer there, the village became deserted, with the exception of the hotel, which was a popular stage route stop. In the mid-1880s, Edward Cruz and his son took over the property and shoot operations. Um, and it's still known to this day as Cruz Ranch. The family concentrated on sheep ranching and wholesale grocery business. Local ranchers and small lumber mills still used the chute until the local wood supply was exhausting, and that was in until uh, 1910. Um, the 1878 Coast Survey map depicts a single trough chute extending out from the cove, uh, out from the bluff, with an extensive network of roads. Um, and rails leading back from the chute to the mill and village to the east. Uh, these uh, there was at least one large building right sided at the land end of the chute and two other small buildings near the rail tracks, um, which would have likely been used for product and equipment storage. And many of these features that are depicted here, although you don't see them in these photos, um, this is where it would have been where the chute was. Uh, resting this rock, uh, and yeah, there's not a pointer. Uh, sorry, um, but there would have been, uh, uh, many of these features are noticeable, um, and we recorded many of the features associated with the landing. Here we go back to that really great um, Peterson map of 1886, and it does indeed uh, indicate that trough chute at the landing with this time a total of six mooring stations, um, two directly tied to the rock face, one on an offshore rock and three attached to mooring anchors in deeper water. Whereas the Gerstle Cove was um, more of a narrow cove, um, they were able to fix more uh, pins into rock would have been easier to secure. Um, but in this case, the cove was too big and they had to use um, uh, mooring anchors instead. Archaeological surveys at Fisk Mill documented a total of 22 features affiliated with the site and lumber chute. The types of features located on the bluff and shoreline are mainly comprised of what we've seen examples of, like the hardware affixed to uh, rock, the cutouts for the chute legs, and structural components such as milled timbers. <clears throat> uh, 
the uh, settlement would have been to the right, the mill would have been to the right, uh, still on State Park property along with um, a portion of town. On the upper right, uh, upper left, say, um, there is a vertical wood and iron log windlass that sits about 50 feet back from the cliff edge, um, northeast of the chute base, and likely was used to help move cargo and equipment at the site. Uh, below that, again, more eye bolt bolts stuck in rocks, and this time, probably to help secure the loading chute, and then those rebates, um, the square cutouts. Uh, in sandstone below that. So once you start recording these, these, um, you, these things start to stick out. Um, <clears throat> it's not moving. There. Um, in regards to shipwrecks, this is not a shipwreck of any of these three. I just like the image of a wreck, but this is off of, um, this is Norma off of 10 Mile River off of Mendocino Coast. Um, this was a bigger vessel. Um, there was three wrecks that were reported in this mill cove. Um, all of them were uh, lumber schooners. And in fact, they provide uh, excellent examples um, of the type of wrecks that we see along the coast. And we'll look at the Gracie B. Richardson. Um, it's a, a great example of a West Coast schooner that was locally built and owned, um, whose loss was typical of the fleet servicing the ports. Um, it was 70 foot, uh, foot long schooner, and it was built in Benicia in 1885. Um, for the Richardson family, uh, which is a prominent family up at Stewart's Point, um, just north of Fisk. It carried loads of lumber products from Stewart's Point to San Francisco for about three years um, until while heading north with general merchandise in 1888 um, in the <laughs> ran aground on rocks in foggy weather um, just north of Fist Mill Cove. The schooner began to break up and the three passengers and crew took to um, a small boat and uh, they were they reached shore safe and sound, but then they left the wreck, uh, which was com considered a complete loss, and um, it broke apart. We have not seen evidence of any of these uh, three wrecks to date. That doesn't mean that we're not going to continue to look. <clears throat> so as the major port on the Pacific, um, and with expanding maritime trade to global markets, San Francisco served as the initial market and distributor of the coast extensive lumber. Um, a, this is a Journal of Commerce again in 1879. Um, they say uh, essentially San Francisco has no rival in her commercial relations. The coasting voyages both north and south begin and end here. The lumber, grain, wool, and other produce is shipped to us for sale and reshipment and every little shoot, roadstead, or landing sends its products to and receives its supplies from San Francisco. Which brings us to Napa. <laughs> um, products and goods would be redistributed and shipped upriver to growing cities like Napa, Sacramento, and Stockton. Um, and uh, again, that, that's photo of uh, Cinderella and the in the upper left, arriving at Napa using the river as a highway. Um, the redwood was a valuable commodity um, all over in growing towns like Napa. It was, it was known to be naturally fire resistant, um, and which was an important consideration uh, during these early days or early town development. Um, lumber products from the coast would have been brought in through these river systems as well but also um, tan oak. High tanning is historically important in Napa. Um, and tan oak would have been supplied by the coast and brought in by schooners. And the illustration of Napa County, California, um, the historical sketch published in 1878, um, it was described, basically uh, the, so the Sawyer tannery was described as the largest and chief manufacturing establishment of Napa County at the time. Um, these are only uh, represent a few products 
And we're only beginning to look into the connection between the coast and inland cities like Napa to fully appreciate that relationship. But today, the docal ports um, no longer see the comings and goings of lumber ships or reverberate with the sounds of sawmills, but the area's heritage continues to be present in the archaeological remains that are present above and below the water. Connecting uh, Californians to these stories adds another dimension to the coastal beauty and wildness uh, the dog hole ports have to offer. And uh, parks and schooners continue to promote stewardship through ongoing research and interpretive initiatives. Um, the Redwood Coast Lumbering Legacy continues to live on in the tribes and coastal communities whose origins, place names, and identity are closely tied to the Dalco ports and their maritime traditions. And what is new, or what we're giving, or what, we, or what we're applying it, uh, is that landscape approach. Um, what is on land and underwater to tell more of a complete story, noting those tangible resources that we can see and measure, like we like to do, but also the intangible that we can't, the memories and stories of a particular place and at a particular time. And with that, I, we would just like to say thank you. Thank you. So if there's questions, curiosities. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, we're, we're, we're just about, we've got uh, Nikel. She's been collecting questions. Um, Nikel, uh, where am I looking for the questions? Um, I know that we were, uh, what, one of the things is interesting, um, certainly to me, Denise, is that um, as Denise knows, I am a huge lover of the dog poets <laughs> and um, have worked in them for a number of years. Um, so, Everybody has their favorite. The dog ports exist from um, Carmel. Um, Julia Pfeiffer Park is the southernmost dog port, I believe. And it comes clear out, goes clear up into Oregon, but everybody has a favorite. So Denise, what's your favorite dog port? Um, I mean, it's an easy one because it's, uh, it's Stewart's Point. It's on private land. But it was um, our first year when we were recording dog hole ports, and I'll keep it short. But um, we had spent nine days on boat and on land recording all of these little bits, right? Um, trying to interpret these little bits that we're seeing at these sites and putting it all together. And this was the first time I, I had been introduced to dog hole ports. Um, and then the very last day, uh, somebody contacted the landowner and we got permission to go onto their property. And um, my jaw dropped because it was like stepping back in time. And I saw, uh, in fact, I just got the chills. Um, the buildings were there. The uh, railroad grades were there. Um, there were stacks of railroad ties stacked, ready to be shipped out that were still there. Um, it was uh, things that were in the warehouses. They had um, uh, large wicker baskets that for loading uh, cargo down into ships uh, were there in the uh, warehouses, chock full of stuff. It was um, beyond belief. And so what a huge treasure Stewart's Point is. And uh, uh, yeah, I just, I, wa I wanna see that protected and saved forever. I like it because the saloon is still there as yes. if they just closed the door. All yeah. the chairs, all the tables, the bar, all the bottles, everything is there. It's like uh, Bodhi so without the ghosts. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, we have another question. Someone is asking, where does the word dog hole come from? Oh, right. I was supposed to say that part. So um, there's two explanations that I've heard. Maybe you know, Shelly, too. But um, the one is, the most popular one is that these little inlets are small enough for a dog to come in and wrap, like circle up and lay down like, like before they go to sleep. Just small enough to go in and turn around. Um, and then I've also heard the other explanation is that in foggy weather, the captains would know where they are by the uh, dog bark of the passing ranch that they were passing. That's what I heard. 
either one probably works. I like the, I think the first one's probably, they called the holes in big redwoods goose pens. They called, they had all kinds of animal names for areas that were enclosed or small. And um, so dog hole is always meant to me that it's so small, it's really the size of a dog hole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get in, <laughs> get out. Yeah. Uh, there are some really teeny dog holes. Um, let's see. I have the, another one here that there, someone found a website uh, at the www.feralons.noaa.gov. Um, and that that's a great source to go look up the dog hole ports in. Yeah, that's, that's who we, um, that was our collaborative project. Yeah. Yeah. With Noah. Mm -hmm. So, um, another question is coming in and just, um, so is the stage hotel at the cruise ranch still there? Wow. I do not know. It is. I was is there it? on I was there on Monday. <laughs> so, yes, yes it is. It just not say that. Answer. That's yeah. great. Hey, I knew that one. That's <laughs> really amazing. <laughs> so the the cruise ranches today are a number of ranches actually. It's called the cruise ranches and I guess they're all together but they're right off plan. So very cool, very cool places. As you go up the coast, all these small little hotels are still there. Um, one of the great things about the North Coast, I think, is that it, um, time really didn't destroy it. It, it just kind of um, put it in stasis. <laughs> so it just sat there for a long time. So right. you go into all these places, it's pretty cool. And um, I think that's the difference, it's like, um, we look at the northern coast as this natural and wild place, like uh, you know that um, where it was very industrial. You know, I mean, it was it was a very uh, it wasn't that um, natural wild place at that time. And uh, there were a lot of people living there. One of the things that I, I would just draw everyone's attention to is the picture that Denise showed us of the big, huge barrel, the turning barrel at the Sawyer uh, Mill. Uh, if you looked at the stanchions holding up that big barrel, for one thing, that barrel was mega size. Uh, but if you look at the stanchions, those are big, huge redwood beams. And, and so, um, you know, we were getting redwood, not only from the hills around the Napa Valley, but from the coast. We got the tan bark from the coast and steamers such as the, or sco scow schooners such as the Cinderella, we're taking hay down to San Francisco and bringing lumber back. Um, the, the, the Zinfandel, the St. Helena, all of those vessels were moving up and down the Napa River, bringing things to Napa and taking our produce and produce back down to San Francisco, which is really quite cool. So I think that's our, all of our questions tonight. Um, Denise? Thank you so, so much for speaking tonight. This has been exciting, not just because I'm a geek about this, but um, I'll, I'll own that one. But I think it's just been exciting for all of us because the Napa River uh, today is really not seen as a maritime highway. It's seen more as a, a little puddle that you could walk across. And uh, I don't think all that many people realize what a maritime port Napa was. So thank you. Thank you for no, helping thank us you. understand. Thank you very much. Uh, do you want to take it away, Liz? Yes, um, again, and, and really, Denise, you really did um, show another dimension of the beauty along the coast that I won't just drive by. My uh, husband and I are planning on taking a trip, a coastal trip. I'm going to be looking. I'm going to do a little bit of homework ahead of time so I can see some of these locations. Um, I may hit Shelly up or you up on some recommendations, but really a new, another you know, another layer to the stories and the beauty of the coast. So thank you so much for sharing this. And, and uh, your presentation was absolutely just stunning, just really beautiful. So thank you for all of that. Um, as I mentioned in the very beginning, if you're not a member, please consider being a member of the Napa County Historical Society. Um, we have all different levels of memberships along with sponsorships. It really is what keeps our historical society um, moving and grooving and we have some really exciting exhibits and presentations for you. Um, the next, um, mark your calendars, we, our fall exhibit is opening. It's called 
who tells our story. Um, this is, uh, we have a guest curator, Dr. Monica Hunter, who is brought in by Shelly. Um, and Shelly's been her right hand person on this um, in putting this uh, exhibit up. It's gonna be placed in the Goodman Library in the Jess Dell Memorial Room. Um, as I said, it's gonna open on Friday, October 2nd at 7 p.m. We'll have a virtual presentation and guided tour. It'll go from 7 to 8.30. Um, to, di to dive into this topic, we have chosen to use the books published by Arcadia Publishing on various aspects of places, people, livelihoods, leisure, and politics, or governance, you'll see, of the Valley as pivot points in examining the who, how, and what we have captured in the stories told about Napa County. This date ranges roughly from 1830 to 1930 era. Um, we also hope to entice you and others to think about the stories that are yet to be told, the voices heard and unheard. Due to COVID-19, we're adjusting as everybody. We've actually um, been pretty much closed, but we're able to open now. So we're gonna open the exhibit for in-person um, uh, tours, if you like, if the space is limited. So um, make an appointment or reservation in advance. Um, but we'll also have virtual tours and virtual presentations and educational models for the curious of all ages. Um, I want to thank our sponsors that made this possible, the Doctors' Company, Ages Living Napa, the Jewish Society, Arcadia Books, in addition, in kind sponsors such as the Chinese Historical Society, Farm Bureau of Napa Valley, and the town of Yountville. I might be missing some. I apologize if I am. With this, with this exhibit, we have four author lectures that um, you can look forward to. On the first Friday of every month at 7 o'clock, it's going to start on October 9th by Todd Shulman. You might be familiar with his book, uh, Murder and Mayhem in the Napa Valley. Well, his, his newest book, his third book, called Lawmen and Lawless, is being released on this same night. So please, you'll find more information on our website about this. Please reserve a spot and, and let us know that you're able to make it. In November, on November 6th, Donna Mendelson, who wrote Jewish Heritage, will be presenting on Friday, December 4th, again at seven, Alexander Brown, a local favorite on her book, Hidden History of Napa Valley. And then we'll wrap it up on Friday, January 8th with um, Ray Guadani, who wrote The Long Road to Justice. These are all available on our website to learn more and to make your reservation. I wanna end by saying on behalf of our board and everyone who believes, history is a symphony of echoes heard and unheard it is a poem with events as verses, Charles Anghoff. We might be silenced without the support of you, our members and our sponsors like you. So thank you very much. Have a good evening and we hope to see you soon. Thank you for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed the programming. Remember, you can social distance while still getting closer to local history.